what is going on guys welcome to the wednesday night live stream we have the one and only adam sutherland on today from fry garage how hey. you doing buddy i'm doing pretty good excellent always good to have you always good yeah. um yeah, we man, definitely it's been a while. we got a lot to uh, catch up on we definitely do and they're always good chat so it should be a fun one today yeah so how you been doing totally i've been doing pretty good uh yeah i mean things have been pretty busy uh coral sales wise uh you know it's kind of it's, it is the season for it and uh coincidentally corals are doing really well so it's always nice when you know i feel like the product is good at the same time and you know things are always changing just a little bit all the time right so it's like some corals look a little better for a month or two and then a different coral looks better for a month or two so yeah you know we do our best right i i, I was actually laughing there's a stream i listened to about that a while ago and he's like oh yeah the certain coral looks great for these three months of the year and he's like i don't bother selling it the rest of the year <laughs> but yeah it yeah, just cracked yeah. me up because yeah. like the seasonality is to certain things yeah i mean like i know that my temperature in here varies a little bit even though i have air conditioning uh it's you know it's still I, I run a little hotter in the summer i can't i you know there's so much stuff running in here i, I can't not have it get a little hotter so uh, but some of the corals might like that so do you do you say overall do you find they're happier or a bit warmer or a bit cooler uh so i've been running the lps softy system a little cooler like around the 76 kind of area and things seem happy i mean part of it to me too is um you know if i can get away with running things at a lower temp um like for example like i'm running the air conditioning in this room at 75 degrees so mm -hmm. like you know i keep the room fairly warm and then my heaters don't really come on very much, right? Because the yeah. room temperature as a base level is about 75. So if the tank's 76, it's, you know, even just the pumps alone are probably enough to heat it from 75 to 76 pretty much. So, yeah, 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 you know, just uh, hard to say. I mean, the SPS system is a little warmer and, um, you know, it's definitely said that warmer temperatures are increased metabolism. So potentially you're getting faster growth. Yeah. Um, you know, same would go for like salinity too. higher salinity, higher metabolism. Just everything is just more. So, yeah. Oh, I haven't heard that about you know, salinity, yeah. but crazy. Like, yeah, I know if yeah, it... no, for sure. I mean, I think that's, that's why uh, a lot of fish systems like uh, hospital systems are kept at lower salinities because it's less, less chance of uh, like a problem perpetuating quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I, I, it kind of makes sense. I mean, if your salinity is high, it's going to raise the levels of everything in your tank, basically, right? Like your L calcium, like everything's going to go up with mm -hmm. it. And if it's low, it's also going to drop everything mm -hmm. with it. So salinity is a big mm -hmm. one for sure. Mm -hmm. Totally. On, yeah. So yeah, go ahead. Oh, I just on a quick side note, all the, all the background slideshow too, is all lovely photos of Adam's corals, which a little eye candy in the background for us. <laughs> Yeah, I just threw together a folder the last minute here, but there's some good stuff in there. Oh, yeah. Love it. So yeah. when when talking about the health of corals, um, one of the big thing is to, or one of the biggest things that I find will make a coral not have nice colors or be unhealthy is if there's pests on it. Um, and sometimes there could be pests that you don't even see on it. I've had, you know, some corals mm -hmm. where it was like paling out and, you know, you think it's everything else at the end of the day, you realize you have like acrid and flatworms or something on there, but they could be so tiny and some of them can blend in so well, it's hard to tell. So w one of the biggest yeah. things is make sure nothing's actually a pest or picking on the coral in the first place. Thank you for that, Pjort. Yeah, so. and I think, uh, you know, the thing that I've had experience with that's probably one of the harder pests to see that's probably in a lot of people's tanks is uh, the gray bugs. Um, unlike the red bugs, they're like a small copepod that go on your Actora mm -hmm. and they, they're a little harder to see for one thing, but I mean, if you're experiencing like less polyp extension and fading colors, like look under a microscope, I don't know, get somebody to look that has better eyes than you. I don't, I don't know what the, <laughs> the best way to find them is. Yeah. Um, there's going to be certain species that they're more, um, you know, they like the taste of more, more smooth skin acros for sure. But uh, in my experience, you have to dose like really, really heavy on them. Uh, like, I think with Interceptor on the red bugs, it was like something like one or two tablets would treat like my 400 gallon system. Mm. And the gray bugs, it had to be six or seven tablets. Okay. So it's I've... some huge, huge amount more. I don't think I've ever actually seen the gray ones personally, or at least thought that I've noticed them. Um, yeah. In, yeah. in the 
chat Josh the Box. Adam dealt with brown slash white mm-hmm. bugs. A lot of sellers in Canada have them and don't even know it. Um, mm-hmm. I wonder the brown slash white bugs might be considered the same thing. I'm not mm-hmm. sure. Um, I think I have seen the white ones, um, but uh, I think it's all kind of the same thing. You know, it's like you know, just be prepared to do a heavy dose and do multiple yep. doses and get it out of there, get it going. You know. Now, uh, does an interceptor work to kill them off? Like, does it take multiple yeah. treatments? Will it get rid of eggs? Do you got to do multiple things to get rid of it? Yeah, well, I mean, the idea of the multiple treatments is that the first one should wipe out all of the adults, and then there could be, you know, microfauna that's still living or some, you know, resilient ones. Like, I, I'm starting to wonder if some of these these bug types that we have in our tanks are have become more and more resistant to Interceptor, you know, as, as mm-hmm. they've been passed on. It's like almost like antibiotic, you know, like yeah. resistance, right? So I think we've got these super bugs. <laughs> And they're, yeah, they are unassuming. Like they're, they're not something you can see right away. They don't do a lot of damage right away, but just gradually you'll, you'll notice less polyp extension and uh, faded colors. And I mean, corals won't generally die from it. They just won't, won't look good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And the other thing to look out for right now, because I have seen it come in in the farms are the, some people call them black bugs, uh, which Mm -hmm. I think is kind of a misleading term because they're, they're actually like a flatworm. They're like some also called the new acroporty eating flatworms. Uh, and they're I, I small actually, and kind okay. of a purple color. Yeah. And they're way worse than the other flatworms. Really? Way, way, way worse. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, my recommendation to anybody getting maricultured acros right now is even if the base looks good, Chop just off. cut the base off, sacrifice a little bit of the coral if you have to, and mm-hmm. remount it. And um, something I've been actually using, let's see if I can grab it here, is I use the, uh, so I use, when I remount stuff, I use this weld stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't, there's probably a few different brands that do it. It's the stuff you heat up in the microwave. Oh, the little, or the little beads. Yeah. Yeah. Because then it really contours to the shape of the coral, right? So you can really, really make sure that any part of that base gets like completely sealed in. Nice. Um, and then use super glue in between it too. So, okay. Um, but yeah, those, those purple <laughs> bugs are trouble. Like they, they lay their eggs scattered, not just in like clusters like the traditional flatworms. So, and would they be hard to spot then? They're hard to spot. I think they only kind of move. And I think their reproductive cycle is probably a lot shorter than the regular types of flatworms because um, they seem to just, you know, jump around a lot faster. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas I, I always found with the regular flatworms like you know you kind of find them on one piece and you could generally get down to the to the egg clusters fairly easily yeah um but these things are just yeah they're they're bad news so i i did have some get into my quarantine system a while back which um yeah that was basically my way of doing it was just remounting everything um yeah even it, they're even pretty hardy against dipping so um huh. crazy yeah, yeah. but uh potassium chloride seems to eventually shatter their little bodies so you know yeah yeah the potassium potassium salt's been the main dip i've been using these days for whatever reason i yeah. find it it's gentle on corals and other ones and it works well yeah like, totally yeah and it's cheap so you know bonus <laughs> yeah totally have you did you, have you tried potassium against like those little purpley evil flatworms or like the gray bugs yeah yeah i mean i i think i don't think that the potassium chloride is 100% effective against the gray bugs, mm-hmm. which is the scary thing, right? Because even if yeah. people are getting corals and they're dipping, I, I can't say for sure because like, I'm pretty sure these little copepods kind of like live in the slime on the tissue and they yeah. kind of have a little protective area in there. Um, so, you know, if, to be on the safe side, I would say anybody bringing in new frags, maybe dip with potassium chloride, right away and then do another dip in a week or something like that just to be sure um yeah that's a good idea so yeah i know when i cutting off the bases makes a big difference i know when i first started the hobby it was like the hardest thing to do i'm like no Mm -hmm. i don't want to lose my precious coral and like but you know i got bit from that there's been times Mm -hmm. that i've had pests in the past and now i'm just like nope base gone don't care it's not worth the risk yeah yeah yeah, and the other yeah. temptation with the base too is it's like a nice, like healthy piece of piece of live rock. There's lots of good bacteria on that base, and mm-hmm. yeah, so, so yeah, it's always the hard it's part. A little sad, yeah, it is for sure. 
but yeah. it's I don't know. To me, it's not worth the risk anymore, especially once you have like a nice big established tank. Like, mm. oh, per- sure. perfect world, everyone would have their quarantine tank on the way into the system, but not everyone does that with coral. So, chopping yeah. off the base yeah. and you know, if there's anything, a, a dip goes a long way to this preventative. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I've been anything I bring in now it goes in the LPS system at first, so there's no other acros in there. So, mm. um, you know, that kind of gives me time to like analyze everything, maybe dip it again. Um, you know, at that point I can decide on if I want to rebase things or not. Like I don't rebase necessarily everything, but, uh, maybe I should. Um, yeah. but y- you can usually tell within about two weeks if there's going to be something like flatworms on there, you're going to see, you know, if you bring in a, you know, 40 or 50 or a hundred pieces, you're going to see something on one piece. So never yeah. fails. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Right. So, all right, we got we got pests out of the way, right? So we don't have any pests that are killing your polyp extension or paling out your coral. Um, next big thing, uh, for I guess, do you think temperature plays much into coloration? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think so. I mean, other than what we talked about with um, you know increasing the metabolism of the system, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know. It'd be interesting if anybody in the chat can weigh in on that. Um, yeah. I I don't think i've heard anything about you know temperature affecting color yeah uh but uh somebody wants to do a study on it then go for it would be good i i yeah in the winter i run my tanks cooler in the summer run mm-hmm. a little bit warmer just because it will get too hot in the summer anyway so then it's mm-hmm. less of a swing so i kind of yeah. do more like 78 and it will get up to 80 in the summer the winter will drop it more down to 76 ish but i it's yeah. hard to compare it side by side if there's a big difference but it's interesting yeah Yeah, I mean, part of me wants to almost run the tanks a little warmer in the winter because if the power goes out, um, you know, I'm in a garage, like literally a garage, and it gets pretty cold in here in the winter if if the tanks aren't on. Um, So, you know, that would give me a little buffer time, right? Like, temperature drops fast. (laughs) No, it's very very true. Now, yeah. before before we started the stream, we're also talking about like, because I know you're saying you're mixed up your salt you're using and how some people will do like mm-hmm. a big water change and then they're like, oh, things are looking better in my tank. Yeah, now, no shit. <laughs> yeah, I, I, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I guess one question, are you a, a believer in water changes? Do you do them very often or just once in yeah, a while? Yeah, I've been actually trying to stick to a little more of a steady uh, schedule. Uh, I've been doing... 50 to 60 gallons every two to three weeks kind of thing. So it's not a super tight schedule, but I, I used to probably do 60 gallons once a month. So I've increased that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also switched from the Brightwell salt to the Red Sea blue bucket recently um, because that's just the salt I actually have the best access to right now Yeah, uh, and good price point. And uh, I have done probably three ICPs since I've been on it. And there are a few levels that I've noticed are way more in line uh, since using the Red Sea. Mm-hmm. Uh, so how much that's affected my system, I'm not sure. But uh, the Bright Lim and uh, Bohemian were always like rock bottom low. Yeah. And those are both elements that told me to add a lot. Like, you know, like it was, you know, add 600 mils of bromine to your tank, <laughs> you know. So, uh, Sh- yeah, the last... Shoot me a message. What was low later? Because it's super interesting. And sometime in the next few weeks, uh, Ryan, another reefing buddy, he actually ICP'd all the common salts. Like he literally sent it an ICP test. I'm going to test him. So I have a big spreadsheet. I've been combining all the data, kind of comparing. It'll be interesting to see how they all like stack up to each other slash the marketing. Yeah, I'd love to see the uh, what the Red Sea came in at. And I mean, Red Sea does. You can look up the uh, the batch number and look Mm -hmm. it up online and. But it doesn't give you, it's not like an ICP. I think it gives you, it might yeah. give you potassium. It gives you all the macro elements. Yeah. Um, but uh, it seems to be pretty, pretty good. Um, yeah, something I was finding with the Brightwell is the alkalinity was really, really quite low on it. Um, yeah. Even though I think it says it's supposed to be eight or so. Uh, I was testing it around sometimes like 6.7, 6.8 at 35 uh, yeah. So I would say uh, like 6.8 you know, to, to 7.5-ish. Little low. Yeah, and that's, well, I mean, I would have to make an adjustment on it before I did a water change, because when I'm doing a 20% water change with alkalinity, water that has an alkalinity that's two points lower than my system, that's going to drop my overall alkalinity, you know, 0.5 or so, you know, yeah. just instantly. So, yeah. uh, so I was making those adjustments, and it's like, it, 
at a certain point, it's just like, okay, I'm just going to try a different salt. So that's fair. So here we go. Yeah. So red sea, but yeah, I know so far it's good. It mixes really fast. Uh, it doesn't have that weird smell that Brightwell has. I don't know if other people notice that kind of skunky smell that it has when you mix it, but, uh, yeah, the red sea seems really good. So, nice. so I'm happy with it. I, I don't have a huge temptation to move towards like one of the pricier salts that are, you know, harder to get regularly too. So what is, so I'm happy. Lo- what is available and easy to get is a huge factor. Mm-hmm, for sure. Now, now yeah. what, earlier when you were saying too, like, one thing, people generally, their tanks look better. Like, I know I had a big elk swing. I did a massive water change. Well, not massive, but like 50, 60 gallons. And my tank did look way better afterwards. And it always does seem to look happier after a big water change, which it doesn't get it nearly enough. Mm-hmm. But then, which kind of yeah. leads me into thinking, do you think it's replenishing? Is it, do you think it's more taking away something that's not making it happy? Or do you think it's more that it's replenishing all these elements that it's potentially lacking? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a little of both and depending on the system, like, you know, if you have a system that struggles with high nutrients that are maybe say in a bad ratio, Mm -hmm. um, you know, like high phosphate, you know, not very high nitrate, um, then maybe that water change is kind of resetting some of that balance a little bit. Um, But on the other hand, yeah, I mean, I think definitely the replenishment of trace is going to be a big thing too. yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people that are using two part are getting some trace from their two part. Um, so, you know, I use the, um, I just buy my own bulk uh, additives and then I use the Fauna Marin uh, trace, the three bottles of trace. Yeah. So um, that's been my kind of go to lately. Um, so, yeah, like, like I was saying, my ICPs have been really close. So, um, uh, and I can definitely say that certain corals that haven't shown the best color in the past, say six months are looking better than ever right now. So, nice. um, now, you know, is it those minor things? I mean, there's other things I've changed too. So, uh, unfortunately I never do one thing at a time. So <laughs> it, it, it really yeah. is hard to do that. So I guess what other major things yeah. would you say change that may or may not contribute to the better coloration recently? Uh, so one of the main things is I think I was chasing, uh, nitrate a little bit too much over the past year. And I've kind of started focusing more on my phosphate levels and actually letting my nitrate be a little bit lower. Uh, uh, so I've been sort of aiming for, then it's, I've been aiming for a nitrate of around five, Mm -hmm. you know, five to eight kind of thing. Um, but I've even let it get down to almost undetectable levels and not really notice any negative side to that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've, always made sure that I have a solid reading of phosphate. Um, yeah. And uh, the main thing I've noticed is acromillipora has really, really shown a lot more healthy polyp extension. Um, and and just they just seem like a lot healthier um, just from adding phosphate. So if anybody's struggling with their milliporas, I think um, pay more attention to your phosphate. Um, I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm experimenting with getting the level up, but it's it's, I have to add a lot. <laughs> to get it to go up. What's uh, your current level? So I get a lot of tests that are around 0.02, 0.03, and mm-hmm. I've been shooting for about 0.05. Um, and I've been dosing the neophos, the bright world neophos. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know if you uh, watched any of the episodes with uh, Dong Zhao on uh, Keith's uh, live stream on the Reef Bum. I Dong Zhao. Don't think I have, but I will now. He, he goes off about phosphates and, uh, I, I think it's a really, really, really good discussion, um, because he's running them at like one. Yeah. And, you know, I I think the, the, probably the main thing with phosphates, it's probably the most important is just not having them bottom out. You know, I think like when we see random, like RTN sometimes it's like, it's an event of, of a total bottom out and, you know, like the. Uh, like the the cells in like the cisenthalae like they they need the ratios of phosphate and nitrate together constantly to sort of create and do their photosynthesis mm-hmm. properly right so yeah now um, how yeah. how important do you think the the ratio is like the red field ratio ish do you yeah. think that is super important because so, like yeah, phosphate so the, i 100 percent agree if it's too low you're to me the corals get too pale they don't look as healthy if you have some phosphate, they get deeper, richer 
more vibrant kind of colors that, that I find. Um, like 0.03 is the lowest I'd ever let mine go. I usually 0.03 to 0.9 is kind of the range, but even higher, yeah. I don't worry too much. But Yeah, so the red field ratio, I guess that's kind of what they estimate is what plants take up nitrogen and phosphorus in nature. And mm -hmm. it's a very like common pattern in nature that's found, you know, everywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, I think that the ratio is, is a little more like flexible in the reef hobby than maybe in some cases, but, uh, like the red field ratio is 16 to one, right? Mm -hmm. So if you were to have 16 nitrate, you would have one phosphate. Um, I mean, my goal has always been to do more of a hundred to one. Yeah. So, you know, if my, yeah, nitrate was 10, my phosphate would be 0 0.1. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's why I'm shooting for the 5.05 right now. Okay. Uh, and I'll, I'll do that for a while and I'll, you know, probably try increasing it. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, I think Dong Zhao was saying more of a 10 to one ratio is what he does. Yeah. But he'll do, you know, yeah. I guess it depends we'll how you're like looking at the decimal, but... Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. The 10 or 100, I think, is like... That's the one I see referenced the most. It's easier to wrap your head around it, too, than try to do the 16 to 1. But you're you're right. I think that is mm -hmm. more specifically for plants, phosphate nitrate uptake, where corals, I think it's... They're a little looser on it. I think they need them both because it is fertilizers. Mm -hmm. It does give them energy. But I think they're, it's not as finicky yeah. on exacts. Yeah, and I think one of the dangers of having too high a phosphate is it does it does uh, prohibit uh, proper calcification when the corals grow. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there has to be enough available for the zooxanthellae to take it in. Uh, but I don't know how much I don't know how much the actual aquifera polyp will take or coral polyp will take in uh, the phos phosphorus in the water. I'm not sure. I don't have the biology background to <laughs> speak on that. But yeah. in in your mind, what do you think is too high? Like, at what point do you think it would start to stunt growth or slow down calcification? Yeah, hard to say. I mean, my systems have always run pretty lean. Uh, I have one system that runs higher, and mm -hmm. but it's now that I think about it, it's always kind of at a good ratio. Like, it would be nitrate 20, phosphate uh, 0.2, you know, or 0.25. Um, and I even found as that system established and things grew more, that ratio actually stayed the same. Like, you know, at one point mm -hmm. the nitrate dropped to 10, the phosphate was 0.1. Yeah. Um, so it, it just, it's proof that, you know, the animals are taking up the phosphate and nitrate at the same, you know, ratio. So, mm, makes sense. Um, yeah, I think as long as it's available, that's the thing. Right. And like your corals will tell you like, you know, some, some of my corals did get a little darker than I wanted them to, but not in like an unhealthy way. Like my yeah. red planet got, got darker. I didn't like the way it looked quite as much, but you know, as an overall, just general, you know, happy medium, I think it's, it's better. So yeah. yeah so I'm, I'm pretty sold on, on focusing more on phosphates, I think, uh, than I used to, I used to just kind of like test more nitrate and kind of make sure there was a reading, but, um, yeah, I've been a little more heavy on, on dosing, uh, phosphates. Uh, something I should also say is, I put my phosphate dosing on a doser head, so it's not just one dose done manually a day. It's added multiple times a day. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I think that probably allows the corals more of a chance to grab it throughout the day, you know, as opposed to just one big shot at once. Yeah, it's yeah. I'm all for like dripping and slowing out that dose as much as you can. I think it's mm -hmm. more availability for longer, which is a benefit for most things. Totally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So phosphates definitely pay a lot more attention to. Um, yeah. I do agree. One of the worst things you can do is bottom out your phosphates for at least Acropora. They will not be happy campers if that happens. So definitely yeah. availability. Now, you're, you're dosing the Neophos. How, how do you mm -hmm. feel about dosing it directly versus just feeding more or giving more coral food or other methods of adding those nutrients to the tank? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to say. There's always the debate. It's like, are the corals taking you know, food in directly, or is there like a biological process that sort of happens and it gets broken down and then it gets, becomes food after, mm -hmm. like, I'm not sure. Is it the fish poop? Is it, is that part of it? I'm not really sure. Um, I think that it's just good to, uh, do a little bit of everything in moderation, like feed your corals a bit. Yep. Um, you know, if you're, 
I don't know if your nitrate and phosphate is still low, then add some like, you know, it's, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. I, I think fish poop goes a long way too. I think mm -hmm. having a heavy, a fairly heavily stocked tank in terms of all the fish poop, I think that actually goes a long way for helping coloration and giving those nutrients to the corals. Um, mm -hmm. where, where again, if you're, you know, a very lightly stocked tank, it's probably the point where you're going to have to add more nutrient stuff. So question for you, how stocked are your yeah. systems? Like there's definitely fish in them, but relative to the coral load, would yeah. you say they're pretty, pretty light or in the middle? I'm there. I mean, my systems are super stocked. Like if you think about like a reef tank versus a yeah. propagation system, you know, there's like all of these like rock areas that don't have coral. It's like every mm -hmm. single spot Inch. of my <laughs> frag tables is covered in coral. So, um, yeah. yeah, when you think of the actual amount of polyps and, you know, actual active growing tips of acros and heads of torches and hammers and stuff, it's uh, it's pretty crazy. So um, things can change fast in a system like this. Like, I think both both the big systems are about 400 gallons. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, and actually, if anybody wants to, I did a system walkthrough video a little while ago. Oh, if nice. anybody wants to check it out, it's on my YouTube channel. Um, I want to check it out. Frag Garage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's way too long. I just ramble. But uh, That's okay. <laughs> yeah, it good. gives you a good little breakdown of everything. So, um, but yeah, no, I think that um, this is, it's like, it's like high stakes in a system like this. Like things can change fast when you have this much coral growing. And mm. uh, yeah, like I'm dosing 50 mils a day of neophos into this tank. And mm. You know, yeah. Um, one thing that should be mentioned is since I am dosing calc, um, calc does some kind of chemical process with phosphates where it binds them in a certain way. So yeah. uh, I think if I stop doing calc, there's probably a chance my phosphates would go up. Um, yeah, but I think yeah. uh, what I'm kind of hoping for is to reach kind of a concentration that kind of just stabilizes and holds and then I can start lowering the dosing. So mm -hmm. we'll see. Yeah, that'd yeah. be good. I think another thing that's important if you're doing dosing of nutrients is making sure you have any algae out of the tank that's competing. If you're not a person that's running like an algae scrubber or something like that, like uh, something I did a while back is I had uh, my overflow boxes had quite a bit of algae in them and I, I just scrubbed and took it all out. And I swear things look way better within a week of that. So really um, just, you know, well, because like <laughs> the corals, those and thalli are competing with those algae for some of the same, some of the same things, right? Yeah. So you don't so, run yeah. any algae scrubbers, refugiums or anything no. in your tank then? No, I don't like algae scrub. They, they don't, they're not good for me. I'm sure they're yeah. good for some people's tanks. They just, um, like I say, uh, my systems have always run, uh, pretty lean overall. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, you're, I, you're yeah. dosing nitrogen phosphate. So yeah, for you, it wouldn't make sense to strip it out counterproductive. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah. And I mean, I have like, I don't know, like three big tangs and a whole bunch of smaller fish per table here mm -hmm. um and, and i think i keep my fish pretty fat and healthy but um i see other people's fish sometimes and they're so fat and i'm just like what the, <laughs> what the heck are you getting this thing <laughs> yeah but yeah. uh yeah no i think uh i don't know yeah like I, not to say anything negative about algae scrubbers i think mean, they're obviously great for some some people's mm -hmm. systems and some tanks just seem to just like want to have high nutrients isn't it like you can look at it and break down all the components of it and it's just like must just have something to do with the bacteria. That's mine. It's hard too to many say, tanks. But yeah. Too yeah, many big yeah, fish. For sure. That's all I contributed to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some now, big poops. <laughs> you bet lots of big poops. Okay. So you're, you're dosing calc to the systems. Um, do you find that makes a big difference for pH for you? Yeah. So um, and we've been doing this around the same amount of time, right? You started doing it about yeah. maybe six months ago or something. Uh, so yeah. So I just do it at night. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like, I didn't want to be depending on it as my primary method. Like I know the sort of Meckley method is, is kind of, uh, it's a way of, a way of doing it. And, but he's very like, you have to do this exactly this way yeah. and stick to this, like, you know, all your evaporation water. Um, I kind of wanted to just like implement it into what I had already. Uh, so I just mix the six grams per gallon, which is the, what Chris Chris does six grams mm -hmm. per gallon calc to, to RO uh, yeah. and make up about 15 gallons at a time. And then I have a little Camor like constant feed pump and it mm -hmm. just comes on, uh, I think at midnight. Yeah. And I have a rule written in the apex that if the pH is higher than say 8.5, it won't come on and it'll wait. So mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Because yeah. 
I don't need it to start adding that calc until the pH drops to a certain low. Uh, and then I think it runs until, yeah, it's like 12 to 12. Mm -hmm. uh, and I definitely have noticed my lowest point in my pH is about 8.25 to 8.3. Yeah. And then my high, I've been actually trying to get the high down because I don't think the swing is ideal um, mm -hmm. to have too big of a swing. Uh, that being said, my high is still in the 8.6 plus kind of range. Uh, so yeah, I'll tell you about another thing I did to, and, and I think this is like a really good thing for a lot of people to consider if, I mean, I'd say if they're struggling from lower nutrients and if they're running a CO2 scrubber is set your skimmer. So when your pH hits 8.4, 8.45, something like that, set your skimmer to come off for until it gets back below that amount again, because mm -hmm. I was trying to, for one, I was trying to get my swing down. The other thing is like the CO2 scrubber media, you have to replace it way too often. So if you can replace it, say, I don't know, like I, I would probably replace it every two months now instead of every month because my skimmer is only on for, I don't know, 12 to 14 hours a day. Um, yeah. And I, I can't even really say it affected my pH high very much. Um, and I think the other thing that happens is that your tank kind of gets a chance to, uh, like the inhabitants of your tank get a chance to absorb some of those nutrients that aren't being skimmed out during that time. So um, I obviously feed, I feed when the skimmer's off and that just kind of gives a, a chance for everything in the tank to, to absorb it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. I, I have a, big fan of doing that too with feeding like giving that more dwell time like when i feed the tanks like yeah. i turn off the return pumps the skimmers for at least like 45 an hour but leave the power heads going so it just keeps all those little particles in suspension yeah. gives more yeah yeah just not going to i need to well yeah so the yeah. issue i've been having like, skimmer off, like for years yeah Go ahead. no oh i was gonna say the, the thing that i've had <laughs> yeah, I know. It was a bit choppy for a sec. Um, so my pH has actually been sucking lately. I, speaking of CO2 media, I finally changed it today because my tank has been sucking so much elk. I keep upping and upping my calcium reactor, mm. which is driving down my pH in the tank because the lower CO2 and the more mills I'm flowing through it. So cal calc is like barely keeping up and doing anything with how much calcium reactor I've been dripping. So, and I'm dosing a ton mm. on top of it. So I finally replaced the CO2 media today just to try and like boost the pH back to a happy level. What's it's the a, kind of range you're running? Well, this morning it was down to 7.7, .7, which to me is super low. I don't like being, being below 7.8. So about yeah. an Whoa, about an hour or two ago oh, yeah yeah <laughs> exactly so about yeah, an hour or yeah. two ago yeah i put um more co2 scrubber media now it's up to 8.12 so it's already climbing and happy again yeah but with the calcium reactor because i used to run it at like 6.7 6.8 but now it's down to 6.4 to try and melt it and keep up with more stuff and that extra point four of a lower inside the reactor has been really hurting the ph quite a bit yeah yeah see in my experience like bad mojo happens in the tank when the ph is low it's like i mm -hmm. think most corals will will tolerate it but like since i've had my base level higher um yeah. like i've just had very few uh just random rtn you know where you get come in in the morning and there's some macros yeah you know gone poop on you it, it it yeah i mean all of those a lot of those like bad bacteria seem to sort of proliferate in those low ph ranges too so um, I definitely say like, it's also like a really cheap thing. Like, so like, I, I would say I kind of do a hybrid method of, you know, my major elements. So mm -hmm. I do a calcium reactor, I dose two part and I do calc at night. I don't suggest everybody do all three of those things, but if you're doing say a calcium yeah. reactor, have your calcium reactor come off at the end of the day and your calc start at night. And then you're, you know, it, it's, it's going to make for one, it'll stop. Like your swing will be way better. Yeah. Um, your pH low will not be nearly as bad. Same with dosing two part. Like I've kind of set up my two parts so it runs about 14 hours out of the day. And I've just made these little adjustments to the windows of everything. So uh, my swings are just smaller and smaller. So I don't know how much, you know, getting the swings smaller really matters. I, I, you know, I'm just always experimenting with consistency and, you know, just any little mm -hmm. thing I can to improve growth and color. So, so you know. I, I, pl I played that game for a little while. 
where I was had my pH super stable. I was doing the same thing, like calcium reactor, turn off at night, dose calc at night, do the dosing. Like I was playing with all the schedules, and I had my pH super stable, super happy, but then I was getting, you know, like about a 0.2 elk swing, and I could not squish that down mm-hmm. with just the different methods. So well, 0.2 is pretty, that's fine. I <laughs> I mean, to I me, mean, I wanted it tighter, point. but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't think that uh, I don't think that matters too much. I think Chris Meckley was saying that you know with his calc, uh, with the Meckley method, it's like there's, there's a pretty big swing in, in mm-hmm. over the day. But you know because I I don't know we've been so obsessed with alkalinity, um, you know he, he's more obsessed with the pH number, yeah. with that stable pH number. So um, yeah, actually the LPS system behind me, um, the next one back, that one runs a much more stable pH range. Um, mm-hmm. doesn't get as high. It's like, uh, it runs probably 8.35 to 8.4. It's like oh, in that's that happy. perfect, perfect zone. Yeah. And that's kind of what, what Chris, uh, was saying he likes to, um, yeah. uh, but th- that system has a calcium reactor and calc. It doesn't do two part. Mm-hmm. Uh, so anything above eight, reason. I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, that tank also has a frag tank in the bottom. That's on a reverse lighting period. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that's another reason that there's just like a better, better, uh, overall swing through the day. I don't know. I, it'd be interesting to know what, like, is a bad pH swing. Like, is a, is a, cause I have a 0.3 pH swing in a day. Like, yeah. I don't know if that's doing anything bad or, or if it's just part of, you know, the process of, you know, the, the, the photosynthesis and the peak of your light, but I know. Same thing with yeah. elk. Like, how how much of a swing really matters? Yeah, yeah, hard to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I keep a display in a local fish store here in Victoria, and yep. uh, uh, that tank I've had some quite a few swings on because I'm mm-hmm. not there every day, <laughs> and it's freaking fine. You know, I've yeah. had swings, like lots of swings. Well, I don't know, did... but that tank also has higher nutrients, yep. which I think has something to do with that too. Um, I think when we talked to Ryan uh ryan cunningham he was talking mm-hmm. about that too it's just like corals that are i don't know higher phosphate fatter healthier corals seem to be able to take they can handle it better yeah I, I i would agree the ones that are super pale and like on that edge i feel like you're riding the edge and if they're a big swing could throw it off mm-hmm. but if they're you know nice and dark and healthy and thick so and telly like they're they're just more resilient they're able to yeah. handle the stuff more yeah, that, I think that was another good point in that conversation too. Was uh, that when your nutrients are kind of rock bottom, it kind of it makes you closer to that ratio going the wrong direction, you know? Mm-hmm. Because when you're at zero, you know, one thing changes, your phosphate gets higher and your nitrate stays the same. Then you have this inverted ratio. Bad stuff, not bad. So yeah, um, yeah, I, I definitely do agree. A little too. bit of elevated nutrients is good. I, I think so. And I also do agree that too low of pH is definitely more stuff can happen, you know, like more susceptible to like an RTN or STN or something else happening in the system where once you're eight and above, it just seems to be able to take more in a weird way. Yeah. And that's why I think, um, you know, bad things happen at night. Like, you know, I've, I only ever notice corals dying in the morning. It's never yeah. really at the end of the day. It's like you come in in the morning and you're like, oh, that thing's peeling. You know, yeah. it's because it happened during that pH suppressed period. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah. But yeah, like I say, it's been a lot better since my my base level has been higher. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, you've also definitely. been running some of your skimmers half time. Now, is that just because you mm-hmm. need more nutrients, basically? Yeah, like there was kind of like three reasons for it. So one was saving CO2 scrubber media. Mm-hmm. The other was getting a little less of a swing on my pH throughout the day. Although I don't think when your skimmer's off during the photo period, it actually matters that much because there's less CO2 to be scrubbed. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's hard to say for sure. Um, uh, And then the other thing, yeah, was just getting nutrients up. Um, Yeah, I used to turn my skimmer off all the time. It was a thing I used to always tell people to do. And then for the past, I don't know, like a couple of years, I've just kept it on. Like, I got to keep the skimmer on. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I was like, yeah, that used to really work well. And it's like, it's such a simple little thing you can do. Like just, um, just yeah, write a little rule. Like what I did is I wrote a rule in with the apex. So if my pH hits 8.45, uh, 
uh, my skimmer turns off and then mm-hmm. it comes back on. Um, yeah, probably sometime early in the, in the next morning kind of thing. That's all right. I, I yeah. did it on mine just because, well, one, I need nutrients, more nutrients in the tank beside me. Just by having algae, my phosphate readings are next to nothing. But um, yeah, could be a false positive. But just it's quieter for recording and doing stuff like this. Totally. Win-win. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, like, our skimmers are so much more efficient than, than we give them credit for sometimes. Like, I'm sure you've dumped a, a, a load of skim it into your sump before, right? Ah, some spilt. <laughs> Yeah, or if it's overflowing, like, you just drain some, and you're like, yeah. Yeah, right. but like, we, I think most people have had an incident with that, and like, yeah. once you get the skimmer, you know, the initial foaming kind of under control, like, it gets all of that stuff out, and like, I don't know, like, barely any time, like, like you know, like a less than a day, all of the skip, like the skimmer cup will be as high as it was when it emptied. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think our skimmers are pretty damn efficient, yeah. and we can most of us can afford to have them off for part of the day. I don't think it's going to do anything bad. Yeah, yeah. it's true. As yeah. long as you don't have like crazy low pH, I'd say you're fine. Um, yeah. That being that yeah. being said, if you have tons of people breathing around your tank, you're just your skimmer is probably bringing that low CO two air into your system. So it's another slight mm-hmm. consideration. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now, for sure. And I've been doing the research actually since we mm-hmm. we kind of talked about it a while back. I've been doing the recirculating. Uh, I feel actually pretty safe about it. Um, as maybe far it lasts as longer. Yeah, and I have the um, the collection thing lower than the skimmer. I think that's the main thing um, mm-hmm. we need to make sure. Um, but uh, yeah, no, this is my scrubber media lasts so long now. I think I just changed I changed the stuff out on the LPS system, and it was the date was like July twentieth or something like that, and I just changed it last week. Oh, so that's I got pretty good. you know what is that two and a half three, three months. months three months yeah. yeah it's pretty good so <laughs> yeah so. Yeah. All right, I changed mine today, yeah. so I'll remember it off nice. the stream for when I can figure it out for future. See how long it lasts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Does you know, Adam... What else has changed? Yeah, what else? Oh. Question in the chat. Does Adam bubble yeah, scrub yeah. at night to keep pH up? Do you inject air or do any form of bubble scrubbing into your tank? No. Um, there was some concern. I know that the moon, Reef Moonshiners, Andre Mueller, was mm-hmm. saying something about uh, he had some concern for people using these recirks on their CO2 scrubbers and how it could deprive the system of oxygen. Um, I don't really think that would matter unless it was a very like closed system. You know, it's like um, like my tanks are like there's no paneling on the sumps. Uh, they're just constantly taking in tons and tons of air. So uh, I think that's a very case by case thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose if you had a tank in a small room uh, with not a lot of good circulation and it was like a closed stand, it could be a problem. But, I, uh, I actually had a big conversation yeah. with about this too. And I guess yeah. there's some medical research again about some of the potential like off product types of things but it was more around mixing with anesthesia and stuff in there so i don't know if it directly relates mm-hmm. to reef tanks but i think that's where some of it yeah. stemmed off of with some of that research yeah honestly i don't really it's not something i would be concerned about and, and i don't mm-hmm. think it's the kind of thing where you would notice anything like all of a sudden yeah um no you know, like yeah it's hard to say like how much of a difference it makes but on mine because before i ever did the recirculating i ran a fresh air line to the skimmer and when i had the mm-hmm. recircling i'm like okay, i already have this fresh air line so i teed it so it's like partial recirculation partial fresh air mm-hmm. kind of blends it so mm-hmm. it's kind of something in the yeah. middle of the two but yeah i think that's good yeah. yeah and something i do actually in the garage here is i do open the uh the garage door at least once a day and like the all oh, the nice. air exchanges in here so it's like that opening a big helps. giant window. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that probably makes a big difference. So, yeah, I I know. Yeah, did you say there was a question in the chat, or did, um, I, did you get that? That was about the bubble scrubbing. Yeah, there probably was more. If I miss any questions in the chat, just ask them again or tag me in it so it highlights it. Yeah. yeah. Um, cool. Eric, how do I raise nitrates without raising phosphates? The easiest way is to actually just dose nitrates directly. Like I know Bright Well has their new yeah. nitrate. I know some people do the more sketchy method with like stump removers and different things, but just dose a nitrate yeah, product I directly use, to the tank. Yeah, I I like the ESV nitrate, uh, the mm-hmm. ionic nitrate. That's that's kind of and you can buy it in like big tubs of it too. So um, nice. yeah, you can you can 
if you can find like a higher grade of calcium nitrate, I'd say that's better than using potassium nitrate because mm -hmm. potassium nitrate is going to raise your potassium. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, I mean, the ESV stuff's cheap enough that just, just use that and you can trust it. I'm pretty sure the ESV is calcium nitrate, or at least it's, um, it's, uh, it's nitrogen salts that don't contain potassium. I actually did, mm. I had a funny way of testing for it to see if it had potassium in it is I did a potassium test with the Salifert kit. And then I just put a few drops of the nitrate in there and just to see if the color would change. Cause obviously so concentrated that it should create a reaction right away. And it didn't. So yeah, I did nice. the same thing with the neophons as well. So yeah, just, just cause they don't really tell you what's in there. They just say like nitrogen salts or phosphorus salts or whatever, proprietary yeah. salts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's actually a really easy way to test it. Now, speaking yeah. of that, um, do you do like on the trace element side, do you dose potassiums or any of that type of stuff to your tank? Yeah. So I think potassium is probably one of the main things. If you're going to like really look out for any, I mean, it's not even a trace element. It's, it's really more of like a main, main element. Um, but just like try to not let it get below 400. And if you want to try elevating it, do it very slowly. But, um, you know, a lot of people have said in 450, 500 range, if they've seen improvement in color. I haven't really done that yet. Um, mm -hmm. Probably one of the next things I want to do is like actually elevate it. Uh, I just, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it really, really slowly. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. De I've definitely been there. Um, elevated potassium does make things feel like it's a lot more like vibrant like it the color does seem better i don't know vibrance the only way the best way i can think of like explaining mm -hmm. it yeah but yeah, yeah. you just got to be careful not to push it too high which yeah chris chris warned yeah. me about that one i was on that line for a while there yeah yeah no i can say for sure um i had a, one of my frag systems at the store uh every time i put rainbow looms in that tank which is like an easy acro mm -hmm. within a day or two they'd be just gone just toast like completely fried hmm. and gone uh so i did an icp on that system and the potassium was like 330 or something like that 335 it was low um so i did a big water change and i just gradually brought the potassium up and uh now i can put rainbow loom in there and they're fine they're, really like, so that, one, that great. one element was basically yeah it's like starving it's out the coral times i can say that like there was a direct noticeable you know change when i you know i mean i guess you could say yeah i also did a big water change but i had mm -hmm. done that before i had done big water changes before you know like 20 25 percent like a fairly large one where i'm replacing some trace yep. but uh that was the first time where i was like okay let's bring the potassium up to you know seawater or beyond levels and mm -hmm. things seem way better so yeah so on that note so how I guess this kind of leads into it, but how, how value or how important do you think the trace elements play into coloration on corals? Yeah. Um, well, there's a lot of methods obviously out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm still kind of like one thing I want to say about the moonshiners method and I haven't tried it, um, mm -hmm. is something that all the moonshine tanks kind of have in common or people that run that method is that they had really nice tanks to begin with. Like nobody's like, deciding to do moon chiders that's been reaping for a month you know what i mean yeah <laughs> like, fair like fair it's point. kind of something where people that are already very good at keeping sps corals mm -hmm. uh they kind of go okay i'm going to take this to another level um i'm curious like yeah. i know that ryan cunningham he did a he did a moon shiners thing he switched over to moon shiners recently so um yeah and i mean i, I think like a lot of it is kind of how these elements work synergetically with each other. It's not just about, you know, getting this one higher or this one higher. It's yeah. It's about having all of them. I, the tests that I do, I do the fauna Marin, um, ICPs. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a couple elements, like they have their basic ICP and then they have their total ICP, which is kind of nice because the basic ICPs are, are pretty cheap and they give mm -hmm. you most of the things you care about. Um, the, the total does your fluoride, but it doesn't do rubidium. That's something I've never, rubidium and solidium, I don't know if are on there. Um, so how important those ones are, I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's just like little, little tweaks, right? Like, yeah. maybe, I, maybe I'll try it at some point. It, the, the thing is like the ICP thing is like, how much do you trust those tests? And well, 
eventually are you going to get a test that's off and add too much copper or something? He, yeah. Okay, so he, here, here's my thoughts on it because I get asked this question constantly. If you never do a water change, if you hate water changes, then ICP tests have a lot of value because you are most certainly going to be deficient on certain trace elements. Yeah. Now, and usually stuff's not going to die, but it just won't look its best. You could you could yeah. never worry about trace elements. You could never do an ICP test. You can have an awesome mixed reef for an acro tank. You know, you do water change once in a while. Things like things can still look good. The, the, the whole trace element game is like, you you know, you're, you're 90, 95 percent of the way there, but you want that extra five percent to get like the crazy colors and like the extra vibrancy yeah. out of it. So it's like one of those games yeah. that you, you don't need to play, but there's definitely advantages if you're a hardcore reef keeper. Um, yeah. Now, my other thought sometimes is like, OK, you spend, you know, 50 bucks on ICP test or you spend 50 bucks on salt and do a massive water change and you probably replace stuff. So if you're mm -hmm. casually about it, like sometimes I'm just like, OK, just do some big water changes periodically and you're probably like. Yeah. not have the hassle but if you do want to play that game periodic icp tests give you that insight into all those like micro macro elements that you very, very well you know maybe you're overdosing it maybe you're deficient in it and then balancing that back out can definitely make things happier that's yeah. my rant. and i think um you know something that's nice in canada we have the fauna marin uh mm -hmm. distributor for north america so um you know sending our icp kits here actually so here's the thing a lot of people should know is he sends them off on tuesdays so if you're sending a kit in you need to make sure it gets there by tuesday because they get there tuesday and then he sends them to europe i think overnight yeah. so if you get there on a tuesday i often will get my results uh thursday or friday if it's oh, uh, wow. icp if it's a total it takes a few more days really just anybody that complains <laughs> about how long it takes just make sure you're on the right cycle so if he gets them on a tuesday you know, send it overnight on, uh, I don't know, send it on a Friday just so it gets, you know, it gets there Monday yeah. overnight. Because it's really nice to have that snapshot close enough to when the tests were done. Ah, that's good. Um, I always have to wait a yeah. few weeks, so that's good to know. Yeah, now, yeah, that's that's a big one. One other thing that I'm somewhat a little bit curious about, if you send off, you know, if your ICP is done within three days or is done in three weeks, are you losing elements out of that water? Like, is it being skewed if it takes a while to get there versus being done quickly? Yeah, I mean, I mean, any amount of time that goes by, like if something is becoming deficient, it's probably going to continue to be more deficient. But like, uh, would, uh, um, but yeah. with that test tube, would the water in it like modify itself? I, I guess is more what I'm saying over time. Oh yeah. Like yeah. would those elements yeah, change? Yeah, um, I don't know. I think there's certain elements uh, that have a, they really want to stick to things. Um, like they want to stick to the side of the vial. Like I think mercury is maybe one of those things. There's like mm -hmm. certain things that want to stick to the vial. So um, okay. yeah, I would imagine that the faster you get it to them, the better. But I think there's a reason that they get you to uh, fill it underwater, you know, zero oxygen, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, but yeah, no, I can't. I, I I couldn't speak to the chemistry of it. That would be a question for uh, Chris Wood or something. I, somebody like that. Yeah, he'd be able to tell you for sure. Right. Yeah, I'm due. I'm gonna send one off tomorrow. I haven't sent an yeah. SP test out in ages. Right. Inspiring. Yeah, and me. I think in in the in the in the states, um, there's so many good ICP systems. There is just uh, I use the Fauna because I can get it to them yeah. quickly and. I do like the option of having a cheap kit that's that's uh, 20, 25, 28 bucks or whatever, nice. um, you know, because most of the time I don't really care about all of the other little tiny, meeny, teeny elements. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, do you, actually, here's another question. Do you dose anything that you don't test for? Speaking of teeny, tiny, random stuff. Oh, interesting. Uh, no, I don't think so. Not really. Um, like as far as icp icp would cover most of the things that that i that i dose for sure and i, um, I guess yeah. how often do icp is the next question i try to do it once a month oh, um, good. one thing that i do i notice that my icps are usually the iron is zero mm -hmm. um and i think it's just because iron just gets taken up really quickly yeah. um so i have been adding i add about a mil of iron to my big systems per week Kind of thing um just to make sure there's something going in there mm -hmm. um and i am i'm going to try the isolate mt soon which is the, the captivate stuff 
Um, so he's kind of, he kind of made a composition of what he thinks are the most important elements. Uh, so yeah, um, I'll probably start dosing that on top of what I'm doing and just be really conservative about it and see, see if things get better. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I wish I had in front of me of what, what those elements are, but, uh, um, so, yeah, Chris Wood basically figured out what he thinks are the most important ones so, in the nice. right ratios. Now, now, the other thing you mentioned too is that conservative dose. If you are not testing for something, then definitely like conservative dosing goes a long way. Like I tend to like to, you know, do a half dose of something for a while, especially if you're not testing yeah. for it. Yeah. I mean, I think the thing is like, yeah, like something is better than nothing, right? Like if you're adding, uh, yeah, like do a quarter of what the recommended dose is. A lot of these bottles tell you to do so much more than what I would ever consider doing. It's, it's yeah. just kind of crazy, you know? So, um, but yeah, no, I think everybody should do an ICP every once in a while. It's like, it teaches you a little bit about your tank, like do it when your mm -hmm. tank's doing well, do it when your tank's not doing well, just kind of compare. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and like, I can say too, like there's been times where my tank has been just doing awesome and I'd sent an ICP and I was low on a lot of trace. So, you know, it doesn't really tell you for sure that, that the trace is, is everything. I, that's why, you know, back to the nutrients thing, I think if you're just, if you're going to put any of your effort into anything and you're concerned about coral health and color is just get a really, really good consistent, uh, nutrient ratio in your system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Um, yeah. Is there, what would you consider too high of a nutrient ratio or too high of nutrients? So you, you're definitely keeping your phosphates higher than you used to now. Right. But in your mind, yeah. what would you consider too high? Like what, what's your upper limit? And you're like, oh yeah, yeah no, nope, that's too much. I mean, I don't know because like, I think it's, if the, a lot of people say if the ratio is, is in a healthy range, they can be quite a bit higher mm -hmm. than you would think. Um, yeah. Again, like my system that's at the store, the, uh, the, uh, display, it's been way, way higher. It's been like 50 nitrate, you know, and five phosphate and things look great. And you know, when it started getting worse and I started having algae growth is I put on a, a, a um, algae scrubber because I wanted to get the phosphates down. Yeah. And then algae blew up in the tank because I messed up the ratio. Yeah. You know, and it took me like six months to get it back on track once I got that, oh, maybe three months. Once I got that scrubber off and I just let the nutrients be higher. It's just, it's what the tank tank just settled in and it was happy that way. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that the, the numbers change a little, but like I say, they stay in the same ratios. So, Oh, yeah. I got, I got another good one for you. So if you have higher Shoot. nutrients, you can also push your flow and your lighting higher as well. Right now when so, like some corals, like I'm kind of curious in your experience, since you grow a bazillion pretty corals, do you find or have you compared, I guess, lower nutrients, lower light versus higher nutrients and higher light to kind of like push that higher par? And have you noticed like a big difference between either end of that spectrum? Yeah. So I've heard some controversial kind of statements recently that corals with lower nutrients can take more light. Um, I don't know what the explanation behind that is because... You know, in my experience, it's like a coral that's darker and deeper and, you know, has more zooxanthellae is essentially like almost like it has sunscreen. It has like yeah. deeper pigments. It's more resistant. Um, so, yeah, like I've all, I, I've without intentionally doing it, I've tried all kinds of things over the years. Right. Because, mm. you know, I've been doing this for, I don't know, 22, 23 years. So I've had tanks that have had tons of light, low nutrients. It's just a different look, um, you know. Uh, I think I'm glad that the sort of Zeovit kind of look is not a sought after thing anymore. Um, because I think that was riding a really fine line, um, where I think stuff could die pretty easily yeah. if you screwed something up. Right. I agree. But, uh, yeah, let's see. I'm trying to see if I'm bouncing around the question a little bit here. Um, like, cause I know some people yeah. crank crazy amounts of par trying to get more colors out of the coral. But generally, the higher yeah. par, like you need more flow, and generally, in my opinion, you also need more nutrients with it. Yeah, and I definitely have been. I have been turning my lights up a little bit since I uh, have been raising my phosphates, and as things get darker, because it's like if it's darker, let's try shooting more light at it. 
And uh, I think that's resulted in some better coloration. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, the main coral that look way better for me are my acro milled coras, like since mm -hmm. I've been getting my phosphates up. So um, yeah, so that's a big one. Tenuous have always liked a little dirtier water too. Yeah. Um, now, yeah, for sure. Do you, that's another question too. I, I, a lot of times I question if we keep our water too clean these days. Like I know I personally do because I love not even seeing the water and look like my fish are floating. Like I love that. But mm -hmm. I, I also question constantly is, is it just too clean, right? Like are we limiting our corals for not letting it get enough particles and food from our pristine, what water tanks? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's like they measure nutrient levels in nature and a lot of reefs are pretty pristine for large parts of the day, um, you know, and it mm -hmm. could be more like seasonally, there's certain nutrients and currents that come in. Um, but, you know, that's more talking about like a, an SBS shallow reef versus, um, you know, some of those regions where a lot of the, um, you know, meat type corals are collected. They're dirty. That's dirty areas. That's like, you know, um, high nutrient. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah, hard to say. Like, like if you're diving, like there's that constant like marine snow type of stuff. There's always particles. There's always mm -hmm. stuff in the water, mm -hmm. which is like a food source, which our tanks are pretty pristine. Yeah. We we do not have that by any stretch. Yeah. Versus yeah. like the constant food availability in the ocean. Yeah. Well, and I think that, you know, one of the reasons we supplement nit nitrogen and phosphorus is is because a lot of the uh, corals aren't getting the amount of food that they get in nature and they, they bring in the food and inevitably at the same time they take in nitrogen and phosphorus too. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's another good reason to, uh, to feed a little bit. I, I do the, uh, reefroids a couple of times a week. Um, try to turn so, the returns off or the flow way down and yeah. Yeah. So, so reefroids does add some phosphates to your water. So uh, yeah, now here's another one for you. Do you think there is an advantage to feeding something like reefroids more frequently versus dosing a liquid phosphate to your tank? Yeah, again, that kind of comes down to the like feeding the fish versus, you know, adding just the straight elements. I don't know if one is more biologically available or if it's all the same at the end of the day. Um, I would love for somebody to do a study on it mm -hmm. um, because it would be interesting to try a no fish reef you know where you you don't you don't feed like say some super super like i don't know like no live rock just like a, a tank that just has coral coral and water <laughs> you know yeah. and then you then, then you could really like assess what the coral actually needs you know mm -hmm. um because there's no secondhand food coming in it's yeah. just like it's exactly what you put in there so um, True. um I, I would definitely want to get into more experimenting like that uh, eventually yeah. Um, I think, you know, like us as, uh, you know, hobbyists, we kind of have this like funny, um, you know, ability to learn and test and study and, you know, even people that, you know, go to school and, you know, become biologists, it's like a lot of them will never spend this amount of time with coral. <laughs> like, it's true. You know, this is my full-time job just messing around with coral. So I'm learning all the time. Yeah. We yeah. are pros of the yeah. anecdotal studies. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Professional Fringe science. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Wahoo Reef. Does Adam still use flatworm stop? Yeah, I do. I'm kind of, I want to try not using it for a while and see if things get worse because it's, it ain't cheap. You know what? But, uh, yeah. I used it for a very long time at a half dose. And I eventually ran out and I don't know when I ran yeah, out, yeah. but I ran out and the tank is still super happy. Um, mm -hmm. I remember talking to Jess a while back yeah. and he was like, it's coral crack. And he's like, just be careful when you stop. Like, so that's, yeah. he kind of scared me a little bit. That's why I only ever did a 50% yeah. dose of it, but it ran out and I haven't bothered point. replacing yeah. it and things, I haven't noticed any big difference. So if you do, I'd yeah. just say like cut your dose in half and. Yeah, since we don't know what's in it, really, um, it's possible that like it's helping for another reason that we aren't sure about, and that when you start adding it, your corals start doing better because I don't know. I heard there's potassium in there. I don't know. Maybe there isn't. Maybe there is. You yeah. know, maybe just that's what the tank needed was potassium. I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but uh, 
Yeah, and and you know maybe also it's a product that's good to use for six months and then to wean off of it and then start it again. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, hard to say. I mean, the ocean is always fluctuating and changing all all year. So, um, yeah, is it? Yeah, it, I mean, is uh, it fluctuating though, or is it just like the biggest body water ever, so it's consistent? I mean, you you have I, tides and everything flowing through. I think that's probably regionally through, so. dependent, but there's yeah. definitely times of year, probably in most tropical regions, where there's more of an outflow of um, you know nutrients coming in from you know more rain. Uh, like more rain is going to mean more streams coming down, more nutrients getting added to the water, more algae, more fish coming in. So mm-hmm. I think, yeah, no, I think the change is quite probably, probably fine mm-hmm. to make a, a, a change for six months and to take it out and just, you know, we learn from that too. Right. So Se- seasonal yeah. shift. Okay. What's, what's your feel on yeah, amino totally. acids? Especially like you think about like, Amino acids, yeah, I thought we'd probably get here. Um, so I think amino acids have more of an impact on lower nutrient systems. Um, mm-hmm. I don't typically dose them. I did for a while. Um, at times when I felt like my coral were looking a little light, but now I just darken them from from uh, from nutrients. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I'm not saying I don't think they're good i'm just saying at this point i don't think they really benefit my systems very much Mm -hmm. um and i've I've definitely given them a good go like multiple different products um but yeah i think i don't know just feed more there's amino acids in a lot of our foods that we feed too right yeah this is true yeah now what do you mainly feed uh, so I do some pellets probably once or twice a day, whenever I think about it. Yep. Uh, we talked about the reef roids, maybe once or twice a week. Uh, and then I just do a big feeding of frozen. Um, I like this spirulina brine, um, mm-hmm. and I'll do mysis. Um, for a long time, I was able to get this plankton that was like collected actually near here mm-hmm. in the Georgia Strait. Um, and it was the best freaking food ever. Um, and it's like literally like marine plankton, like harvested at the end of the summer, right when the plankton blooms happen. And it was the best food. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't know if anybody knows if there's anywhere we can get it anymore. But uh, yeah, it was Tim T actually that uh, Sea Care. Do you remember Tim? Um, I heard the name, company. but I don't know him. No. Yeah, yeah. He's kind of out of the game, but that was that mm-hmm. was the best food I ever fed for sure. I haven't nice. tried any of the LRS stuff. I know that's really really good quality stuff. Um, I just don't know if I'm willing to spend the extra on the the expensive food. I'm sure it's freaking awesome, you know. I haven't tried it, but I've heard good things. Um, yeah, I feed a lot of if they mysis. Want to send me some, I'll try. It. That's fair. Yeah, I, I I feed a lot of mysis, which for whatever reason I feel like has a certain amount of aminos and stuff with it within the shrimp. Um, yeah. that and cannulus I feed very frequently. And then randomly just dump in random reef nutrition stuff just to mix it up for like variety for all the smaller particulates and the different creatures. Yeah. Do you uh, rinse your mysis? Do you thaw it? Rinse it? No. I probably should because I always have higher phosphates. But... Yeah. I I kind of like I go in and out of it, right? Because I'm like, well, they're actually like a freshwater shrimp. So they come like, from Okanagan Lake. That? I can see the lake up yeah. the window. <laughs> so what's, what else is in that water? Like it's probably fine. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah if you want to be on the safe side rinse it but there might be some good stuff in that water too right so my um, and it's just so easy to take a frozen clump and just let it thaw out in the tank yeah. you know yeah oh yeah just pop that frozen chunk on your power head and is it the thaws yeah. it just shoots around the tank and the fish go nuts yeah it's great but easy yeah my thought has always been the fact that um all those tiny particulates that you'd rinse away is going to be like your aminos, those little particulates that the corals are going to eat. So to me, that's always been coral food. So yeah. it sucks for, you know, if you have a phosphate issue, but it, I, it's also to me like an awesome source of coral food. So that's always my thought on it. Yeah. 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 No, for sure. Yeah. I'm on, on, on it, on, on that with you. And I like it cause it, it's like harvested like 10 minutes away from here, which I think is kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. Backyard. Yep, yeah. Pretty much. Uh, what were some other things we were going to talk about? Um, Do you have yeah. bunnies? 
You have plenty um, of yeah. churches in Kelowna. I do. You're, you gotta go to the island for, for Adams. Yeah, you got some nice gawnies. For <laughs> you sure. do actually. The, the ones uh, on the thumbnail are Adams. Mm -hmm, Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Those are some nice ones for sure. Beautiful. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, light a little bit because we haven't really gone there. We mostly talked about nutrients. Mm -hmm. um, so I think something I've kind of started to realize lately, like I get a lot of messages about par and it starts to get a little bit annoying actually, <laughs> but I think people are a little bit too obsessed with the par numbers. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I, I think people need to think more about the distribution of light than they think about the maximum par because, um, you know, in, in nature, the sun moves across the sky and the sun eventually as it, travels across a reef it's going to hit every side of a coral right it's going to hit it yeah. from every angle whereas like you know if you just have a point source type of light and you have a bunch of corals that are in a fixed position they're only going to get light from that one angle so mm -hmm. i'm not so much concerned with the amount of light it's more that distribution so i've heard that the new radio you've had the new radion for a while yeah. right the g6s i've it heard that the the spread is really really good on them yeah, this the spread is amazing. Um, the biggest thing that always blows my mind is I have this one ledge, and the zoas have been growing underneath the ledge towards the center now. Like that's how much light is bouncing yeah, around. The yeah, yeah, yeah. But if yeah. like if I go back like to like a Gen three type of radion or some of the earlier lights, like you could tell over time the because it is more of a cone, and the bottom of the coral yeah. it, it would pale out over time. But with the newer lights yeah. now keep in mind i have overkill lighting because i have like five of them on a six foot tank so there's like an yeah. insane blanket of light with all the intersections but there is yeah. no fading on underside of corals or on bases and mm. stuff like i used to get yeah. like many years ago and i think that adds a lot to the coral health because you don't have parts dying yeah. off because it's still getting light everywhere from that little yeah. cozy blanket of light wrapping around it yeah, like I think I would way rather have all of my acros have 200 par hitting them all over the place rather than, you know, 400 par hitting half of them, you know, half of the coral. Um, I think you really want that distribution. Uh, I kind of like, I mean, these tanks, like I actually added another set of bars to that side. So I've got reef rights and Orphex over there yeah. um, <laughs> and the Radeon G5s uh, and the T5s. So everything gets yes just to painted all. with light. <laughs> yeah. But, but again, it's like my par is actually not that high. It's, I, mm -hmm. I think measured at the peak, it was about 450, but mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, it was like 250 on the edges. So, um, yeah, but I think, I think, uh, people, people like to blame light when corals start not looking so good. Like that's like an easy thing to be like, oh, maybe I need to adjust my lights. And I think the thing to remind yourself is like, well, did the tank do really well for a long time with the lights they were they were the when they were the way they were anyways you know like mm. i've even been guilty of that i've been like okay well maybe i need to adjust the lights because this coral is paling out a little bit and then i realized like no that coral looked awesome for like a year with the lighting the way it was so why would i change it yeah. so you you know just start looking at other things it's probably going to be nutrients but or it could mm. be past I, some of the other things we talked about but uh i think corals will tell you faster if it's too much light, then if it's not enough light, if it's not enough light, they'll slowly tell you like things might yeah. darken up or not grow as fast, you know, but that's a lot safer than, you know, if you give something too much light right away, it's going to, it could bleach out. If it's an LPS coral, it probably won't expand or open up as much, mm -hmm. you know? So I think that's a good, good kind of rule to live by is, uh, you know, start low, well, work your way up. Yeah. Dedicated reefer. Thank you. Um, the, the other thing is too, if you are if you have one coral that's looking crappy everything else is looking awesome like don't go mm. changing stuff in your tank to yeah. piss off the rest of the corals for one coral and i know like some people you know they'll see one thing and they'll go change a bazillion things and realistically yeah. it's just something up with that one coral yeah no totally yeah yeah sometimes it's like it's not even like sometimes it's just the coral itself like it's that specific specimen it's not you know, yep. you know that species or whatever like sometimes like there's just something that happens like um i've noticed a lot of these mariculture acros um come in with this green boring algae in the skeleton mm -hmm. and it, it seems to just gradually like eventually i've seen a lot of acros peel from it um i, I don't know if it's something that propagates in the farms or if it's there and it gets worse in our tanks but 
Um, I've definitely lost colonies, mother colonies that have had it in the tissue. And then I've had frags, frags from the growing tips of that colony mm -hmm. where the, the skeleton is, is nice, nice, clean, pure white. Yeah. And the frags are fine. And the mother colony is toast, you know, so. On um, that note, super random, but yeah. like forest fire digi, I don't know yeah. why, but that, that, that one has never done anything for me. And like my huh. original chunk in my water box looks like yeah. this is like pale, no color, but the new growth off the little smidge that went on the rock is super vibrant, colorful. So like the mother colony and original, yeah. just meh, yeah. like it's boring, doesn't look anything good. But any, the new little tiny growth, that smidge that was on the rock looks awesome. Hmm. And it's just one of those yeah. easy ones, but it's one of, one of those corals that just have never really done anything for me. Yeah. And I think sometimes corals like that, people don't always put it in a great spot in the tank because it's mm -hmm. like, you know, it's a cheaper frag, but it looks yeah. freaking awesome when you give it tons of light. Actually, my yeah. colony in my my far tank right now is like just super popping. So nice. um, I think, yeah, that's a coral that like, you know, it can be a guinea pig for blasting yeah. with way more par than you think could even handle. Yeah, I'll, I'll send yeah. you a picture yeah. later for fun. But the like the original colony versus like the new growth, you wouldn't even think it's the same mm -hmm. coral. Is that yeah. drastic yeah. of a difference? Uh, weird. Maybe you're getting some kind of weird, weird hybrid. <laughs> yeah, who knows? I'll take it, whatever yeah. it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so lighting, don't don't overkill it. Um, coverage spread is definitely your friend. Um, I like the warm, fuzzy blanket of light, a.k.a. not having spots that aren't getting light, so you're not getting that die-off over time, which mm -hmm. I find doesn't happen as much these days with like a lot of the newer, wider lighting. Yeah, now, yeah. On that note, too, a lot of the... Like T5s are a pretty good blank of light. Early LEDs were very like conical and then they're getting wider and wider and wider, all the new ones. That's kind of the main thing I've noticed. And if you have multiple yeah. of them, obviously you got a lot of crossover, which fills in the like gaps, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think actually Kessels have always been pretty good at spreading light well too, right? Like yeah. I don't use them, but a lot of people really love them. So um, yeah, I actually had some people have complained about the G6s and then actually the light spilling out the front of the tank too much into the, whatever room the tank is in so <laughs> yeah they're, consider, I guess. they're yeah. not wrong do you know what i actually yeah. did today to try it i took out um, my diffusers and i left the diffuser on no I, I took out the film in the middle but i left the trim on it and it just like made that little inch of a lip to like cut it down in the office yeah. and actually made a noticeable difference it's like huh nice so yeah that's that's good that's important random yeah. random yeah. test of the day <laughs> yeah totally yep um yeah now, the other thing I consider, too, is lowering the lights a bit closer to the tank, too, because they have such crazy spread. They don't yeah, necessarily need totally. to be as high as they used to be over time. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I've, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's another thing, too, is, like, if you can lower your lights and then turn them down, then you're, you know, not, not running your lights as hard. You probably get more life out of them. Um, less power. You know, less, less, less power draw. Yeah, I, I mean, something I've been definitely trying to get better at in here is, uh, finding ways to get away with less, you know, yeah. like, you know, it's all about that, getting that electrical bill down. Um, so yeah, I, I, uh, turn my LEDs up and I run my T5s only for four hours a day now. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, there's less heat. I mean, if I'm only running T5s four hours a day, the bulb should last me probably three years, you know, because yeah, I true. honestly think T5s are good for a year and a half. I don't care what anybody says i think they're good for at least 18 months yeah how many hours per day far, but if you're only running well, four hours per day you're at like six that's, years that's, <laughs> no yeah well that's what i'm saying it's like yeah. but if you're running them say 10 hours a day mm -hmm. i think you can get a year and a half out of them so if i'm running yeah. them four hours a day like i'm you know and especially with the bulbs i have you know as backups like probably good for 10 years <laughs> you yeah. know so yeah i, I was gonna so, say in 10 years do you think you're gonna be able to get more bulbs or do you think they're gonna be gone yeah i think they'll probably be gone I mean, I think yeah. like, you know, I would actually like to uh, just gradually start turning turning them off or get the photo period mm -hmm. down lower and see if things look better um, mm -hmm. or do as well. I don't think they'll look better. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. 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 I, like I say, I think we can get away with a little less par than sometimes we think we can. Um, so I, it's, yeah, coral dependent, but. I, I have four hours of the day where I do a more intense wider lighting, which is like my cooking mm -hmm. higher power period. And then I yeah. have more of like the AB plus style later in the day, which I think is kind of yeah. similar in a way to what you're doing with your T5s, is adding that extra punch yeah. for that four hour block. Yeah, that's like Worldwide Corals is big on that four hour thing. They kind of, yeah. I, I don't know how they came to that conclusion. Maybe it's like 
comparing to nature because if the sun is you know mm-hmm. hitting from a certain angle it's only ever going to be illuminated from that angle for say four hours at a time yeah. i don't know but uh yeah no i think i think it's good it's like the more efficient we can get our tanks and actually it would be I, i've talked to you about it before but it would be cool to do an episode on um the economical uh eco-friendly uh reefing like just things products we can use things we can do little tricks to just getting our tanks more efficient and uh um, yeah. even saving money on you know chemicals and things like that too yeah 100 percent with you on that one and i yeah. and i have actually been paying attention to that more now that i have all like the outlets i can monitor power and i've been like tweaking things trying to do it but even things yeah. like the uv takes more power but it also creates a bunch of heat so then the heaters don't kick on as much like there's all kinds of weird little trade-offs you can tweak yeah. over time yeah well and there was somebody who was saying this and i i think they were i can't remember what podcast or stream it was on but they were saying that like when the say your G your radion transformer is on, it's mm-hmm. it's drawing the same amount of powder and power no matter what the light is at. I don't think that's true. That's not true. I yeah, I have a battery backup and I put my uh, DC pump on it and mm-hmm. I put the pump down to fifty percent and the estimated battery time like doubled. So yeah, um, like yeah, so an electrician could explain it better. Um, I mean, I'm sure just it being plugged in and doing that conversion uh is is taking something but it's probably it's, it's minimal it's minimal yeah. um because yeah. i'm worried about that because i'm like my radions are on all the time but they're off at night but with, are those transformers still drawing something very little they really um, suck. yeah yeah so can i see one day yeah it's very little at night um because like on mine, same thing. I actually for, it's only a few watts or whatever it was if they were actually pulling. But yeah. I actually scheduled yeah. the outlet. Sometimes I'd make it turn off at night just, just to like off. kill it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I think um, because sometimes like also the um, we know how the the app can be with the Mobius app. I mm-hmm. think maybe resetting them once a day is probably not a bad thing. Because um, yep. actually, yep. I've come in here at night before and um, I've had like one of my radions has been on. Oh no! Like, it's like, what? What are you doing on? Like, like what the hell, man? So, oh, figures, yeah. eh? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So at nighttime, when it was off, it was drawing. When is this? Two a.m. It was drawing like three watts, so next to nothing. Eleven p.m. That would be yeah. moonlight. Thirty-three watts across five thirty. So yeah, it, it's very minimal. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. You you okay. can definitely well, save. Good. And yeah, there if you, you are having okay. any weirdness with Mobius, re- resetting the device basically fixes it. So yeah. turning them on and off at night may mean never have yeah. issues. Yeah, probably a good idea. But yeah, I don't know who said that on what stream or whatever it mm-hmm. was, but they, they were wrong. They were incorrect. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> yeah, if you want to know, if, you want. if yeah. you want to know, the power supply for something is basically how much available capacity it has to provide it. But it only provides more or less what it's asking for. So yeah, it's not going to draw that all the time. But if it needs it, then it has up to that capacity. And then generally, you don't want to oh, really use more than about 80% of it for longevity. You'll burn it up quicker. Yeah, totally. Yep. Well put. Yep. I've been down many of these rabbit holes. Mm-hmm. Um, so any other big things you think contributes to health or coloration? Um, yeah, I mean, there's something to be said for not tinkering with things too much. Um you know, we've all yes. like been away on a vacation and not seen our tank for a week or two and things look better. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, just messing with the tank too much, stirring things up, moving things. I, I'm guilty of it for sure. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I think just try to not mess with things too much. Yeah. Um, How? So yeah. th- this will be trickier for you, but what's your thoughts on like, you know, hands in the tank? Like, are you in there constantly tweaking, moving stuff, or you you yeah, avoid putting hands your hands in the tank in? a lot? I, I yep. give them a good rinse in fresh water, um, mm-hmm. no soaps or anything before I put them in. Um, I don't feel like some people kind of have more oily skin. I don't really have oily skin. I think if I did, I'd be a little more concerned about it. But um, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not overly concerned. I think it would also depend on what you do for a living. Like if you're an auto mechanic, <laughs> yeah. you know, you got grease on your hands. Best of you know, Or if you're a painter, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, it, it's like maybe be a little more cautious. I just like my hands are, you know, not really dealing with any, you know, weird yeah. substances or anything like that. So I'm not overly concerned about it. 
the thought that I had the last year or two with all like pandemics have people in eight gallons of san- san- uh, hand sanitizer on constantly, right? Just all that stuff yeah. you're potentially putting in the tank if you're not rinsing well in between. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think for the most part, the hand sanitizers are mostly just alcohol and um, yeah. like a bit of aloe or something. So it's all pretty, like the alcohol is just going to evaporate off and then the aloe is probably fine. I don't know. Eh, I, I would avoid the aloe in the yeah. tank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably, but, you know, I, I mean, it's still an organic thing, right? It's a, like, you know, it's an organic substance. But that's your secret aloe. of coloration right there. You're dosing Maybe, aloe without know. even Maybe knowing it. Try, try some experiments. <laughs> There's a lot of, uh, yeah, interesting data on, on uh, and observations on aloe. Never there know. was, I remember back yeah. in the day, there was all kinds of random stuff. People like dosing like vitamin C and all this kind of random stuff. Like, have you yeah. tried any of the random, like, non conventional stuff? Yeah, somebody told me to do vitamin C at one point for Zoas. Like, he's like, yeah, your Zoas will pop like crazy if you use vitamin C. Mm-hmm. I don't know. There's so many, like, anecdotal stories like that, right? Like, I mean, I would consult someone that has a biology background because they can. They can see, like, in nature, like, you know, animals take in certain things, right? Mm-hmm. Like, we know that, like, I don't know, like, is there vitamin C? Is it going to do anything to a zoanthid? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Somebody I do know. a study? Sure. Yeah. I, I haven't tried it, but I've read it multiple times. Like, not recent years, but I'm yeah. going to say, like, four or five years ago, I re- seemed to be more of a thing. Yeah, garlic. Like, yeah. I've seen lots of people say that one for fish. There's lots of yeah. other, like, semi anecdotal ones that's always wondered. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the garlic with fish thing is pretty widely respected as a as a positive thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. The, yeah, the, even some of those, like, I think I have tried garlic, but it's hard to know if it actually mm-hmm. has mm-hmm. a benefit or not, or if it just makes you feel better about yeah. it. Hard to say. No, yeah. No. yeah I, I wouldn't say that I'm, like, an expert on fish. So, um, you know, occasionally I'll soak the nori in salcon, or I'll use a little bit of salcon. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, I don't get really too fancy with that. Yeah. salcon has been around forever. That one's fairly mm-hmm. tried and true for some extra yeah. nutrition loading, I guess he'd put it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, totally. vitamin C recommended for fish health. Hmm. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. No, a lot of those like vitamin fish supplements have vitamin C and other, other things like that. So that would make sense. Yeah. Now, yeah. Okay. Other random one. Now, stability in the past was touted as like, you know, if anything else, stability is like the key to happy reef tank. Now with like Chris, Chris's method, for instance, like keep pH high, elk swings aren't as big of a deal. You know, like your pH is 0.3 or something. How much do you think the swings make? Do you think like alkalinity pH or certain things, the stability is a key or do you think it's, we worry about it more than we need to? Yeah. Well, I mean, first I should say Chris's method is more about, uh, buffering the low part of the pH, not so much boosting pH, boosting yeah. pH in the low times of day. Right. Yeah. Um, but when I talked to Chris about it, he, he thought that my pH swing was too high because I think we, we think of things as numbers, right? Like we go like, okay, well my pH is eight point, like how much higher in pH is 8.3 to 8.5. Um, a lot. It's like, it, it's actually a lot. It's, it's logarithmic. Like it's like it's escalates. Like, like a, a good, yeah. a good, um, like analogy to it is like the Richter scale. It's like, like it's actually every yeah. point in the Richter scale is a hundred times Huge. more. And it's like, oh, well, it was just a. 4.5 earthquake instead of a four. It's like, no, it's actually, that's a huge, huge. Freaking difference. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Massive difference. So, um, yeah, I, I think that probably, um, I can't say for sure as far as the pH swings. Um, but I think anything you can tighten up a little bit is probably better. Mm-hmm. Um, because you, you're kind of changing the environment, right? Like the environment in the ocean doesn't change very much every day right it's pretty much yeah. like i don't know the temperature is not hugely different the pH isn't different mm. the parameters are kind of just all the same like yeah it, it has to be good to have it have a tighter window how much is negative to positive i don't know i mean like i was telling you my swing is pretty big sometimes like it's it'll be mm-hmm. three three point five point in a day of my pH. yeah but you're like super yeah. high though like you're 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 in the yeah. happy swings you're happy now yeah I guess the other devil's advocate part of this is there's the swing within it, but then, okay, there's the argument that the ocean is like dead stable at all times for the most part. But is 
us elevating? Is it better than nature? Is it better than the ocean? Or are we better off just mimicking nature? I, no, I mean, I think we're at that point. I think we can grow yeah. corals faster in our tanks than we can in the ocean now. Um, yeah. Because we are, we're like, yeah, we're like, we're, like we talked about with um, speeding up the metabolism. If you're mm -hmm. running a tank that's warmer with a higher salinity and all of your trace and your elements are like a little bit on the higher side, like you're essentially making like a supercharged version of a reef. Yeah. Right. So, and if, if, yeah, if a lot of those other elements are in, in, in line, then mm -hmm. um, there's no reason why coral can't grow faster. It's such a simple, there's, I mean, they're complex, yeah. but they're such simple animals at the same time. Right. Like, yeah. you know, really at the end of the day, you're just trying to, you know, calcify calcium and carbonate together and build the skeleton mm -hmm. or, you know, like it's, you yeah. know, it's, it's simple. So there's no reason that that process can't be accelerated. The other interesting thought too, that is like the concept of doing like an eight hour photo period, but you sneak in like two photo periods in a day. So you're like eight yeah. on, eight off, eight on, That's, eight off, eight on yeah. to try yeah. and get more growth from more, more days within an actual day. Yeah, I have done that before and I've thought about experimenting with it again um, mm -hmm. because, yeah, so there's a certain amount of time that I think as corals grow throughout the day, they take they take up carbon dioxide, right? Yeah. And then we know that they they release that. I don't know what the amount of time that they need because there has to be that reset time, right? Because mm -hmm. otherwise, well, they would just kind of essentially get tired like the zozomphele can only... They can only uh, photosynthesize so much. That being said, mm -hmm. um, I mean there are people that that like that grow plants, say mm -hmm. marijuana or something. Um, there's 24 hour cycles in, in some of those yep. uh, systems, right? I don't know a ton about it, but uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I think that if you were going to do a cycle like that, you could do so in a day. Would you do like eight hours, eight hours off, eight hours on, eight hours? Just keep swapping every eight hours. That's my thought. Yeah. Um, or well, you know what? I'm going to do that with my um, zo. So under the LPS tank, there's a um, the the sump has a big chamber that I do my zoas. Um, so maybe I'll try that. Yeah. Because right now it's uh, yeah, right now it's eight. It's about a ten hour grow period that's just mm. opposite to my other lights kind of thing yeah. so yeah no definitely definitely worth a shot i mean if anything we can do to grow things faster yeah. especially somebody the, that's doing it you know the, as a commercial kind of situation right yeah the other thought that i have like i can see three tank four tanks in the background but if they mm. assuming like three tanks were plumbed together you could stagger which one's on at that eight hours you always have a tank that's doing photosynthesis yeah. which might yeah. boost your ph overall is always having one yeah. tank processing yeah. co2 yeah that was a point like uh, uh my friend dimitri made on the last time i think i was on um because mm -hmm. he was saying you know why don't you stagger the two sps tables so you you know you extend your ph period i think the thing is is that that does sound good but i think it's all it's going to do is extend the ph to be high for longer yep. but i'm still going to have the same drop probably would i wonder yeah. if you would though you might build no it'd be an interesting experiment I feel like you well, would be able to reduce the drop, but the... yeah. Yeah. I like working on the tanks. Yeah. It's all about like the hours of the day that I want to work on them. So like, True. I don't really want to have to have a tank where the lights aren't on while I'm ready to do stuff in it. So mm -hmm. I'm going to be tempted to, you know, manually turning a light on and then I might forget to turn it off and. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. That's your logic. Just have like yeah. a reef bright, one reef bright strip or something just to like make stuff glow and work. But yeah, it, it would be an interesting yeah. experiment. I don't know if it's worth the effort, but it'd be totally. interesting to see totally. how it played out. Yeah, yeah I agree. Totally. Uh, da, 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 da. We will never be better than the ocean. I think the, that's what Michael's saying in the comments. I think the whole elevated pH thing is like the up that we have over the ocean with the ocean acidification, like the pH has yeah. lowered over the years. And I do think that's the one benefit that we do have over the ocean is being able to elevate the pH, which, you know, less issues, stuff seems to grow happier, grow yeah. more, be happier. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, hey, Devin, I really have to pee. 
<laughs> yeah. All right. We we can, we can cut her off. Second? Yeah, you can run. You can should run. we end it or should I run? Run? Can you talk about you, something? Yeah, I can talk about anything. That's fine. Do you want to keep okay, going or yeah. do you want to call her quits? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll come back. I'll be right. You're back. on Bluetooth. We're gonna hear you. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I can just keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna cut off eventually. As we hear the the waterfall okay. in the background. So, yeah, I don't know. This is. I think that's the benefit. I think the ocean has the advantage of it's super stable and there's a constant source of food for all of your corals. Um, I think that's one major advantage to the ocean, right? It's dead stable and there's always food, always available. I think our tanks that we have the ability, I mean, we could feed more, but we still have the issue of filtering and removing all the nutrients that build up from having hyper availability of food. However, I also think that being able to have elevated pHs kind of give us a little bit of leg up over the ocean. Now, the other random interesting thought that I have too is if we are able to mimic nature more, how people are able to spawn corals now, right? Like Craig and all those people, to how they're doing coral spawning. And if you can spawn corals, you have a bazillion little tiny gammies that go out there and then, you know, you grow new coral. And I think it would be cool if we get to the point where we can start making like hybrid corals or hardier corals and stuff from there. Maybe we can mix corals and make some other crazy stuff. So I think it'd be kind of cool. Uh, in the chat, dedicated reefer, do you have a recommended par meter for something starting a small selling business? Your, your cheapest bang for your buck for a par meter is going to be the Senai. Um, it's hard to beat that one price wise. The only slight annoying thing is you have to have a laptop or something to plug it into. I have the, uh, do, 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 I'm blanking on the name, Apogee. Apogee? Yeah. yeah I, heard I have Apogee an Apogee, investment. which is great. It's standalone. It's more tuned for blues, which is really cool, but it's also a very expensive investment. Um, if you're doing it as a business, then yeah, I would say buy an Apogee as standalone. You're not lugging around a laptop. It makes your life easier. If it's more hobbyist skill, I mean, it's hard to beat Senai for the price because yeah, it's just half the price or like a third of the price of all the dedicated parameters. So food for thought. I also think, um, you know, I don't own a par meter because I don't want to be too <laughs> obsessed with with the numbers. But like, yeah. like I like BRS will rent. You can rent one or buy it and return it uh, yeah. for a fee. And then it's like also get together with four other reefers that live in your city and, you know, share the yeah. cost of it. Because like just I, you just need to not be too obsessed with thinking that these little minute changes in your par and these numbers are going to matter that much because you need don't. to make sure like, you're not giving it nothing. You need to make sure you're not blasting with crazy amounts. And if you're in the middle range, yeah. you're fine. Like a coral can be happy at 200 or 400 for the most part. Yeah. Right. But you don't want to totally. be at 50. Yeah. You don't want to be at like 600. So the middle range is pretty safe overall. And yeah, for, for the average hobbyist, like if you're in a club, you have something you could rent or borrow from that makes way more sense than buying one. Um, like I have one, but I also like review lights and do products and stuff. So yeah. I have more of a justification yeah. for it. But for the average hobbyist, like anyway. find a friend with one, throw him a frag, bribe him for it. I think that's like the smarter path for yeah. the average person. Totally. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do, do, do. I think, okay, spawn. This is totally off topic, but just because I talked about you're gone. Um, so do you know how like they're able to spawn corals in captivity, simulating the moon cycles and everything? off of that mm -hmm. doing like i think but we'll get to the point where we can do like hybrid corals and different things i think that'll be pretty cool mm -hmm. but being able to make hardier corals i think will be cool and i've always been curious if you are able to do that like those super hardy corals which again amazing for your tank but i also wonder like will they be harder to put back in the ocean afterwards yeah, I mean, I know that uh, something from some of the marine like studying that that they're, that they're doing, and I think in Hawaii it was mm -hmm. a lecture that I saw. Uh, there are some zizanthale strains that are more resistant to bleaching into higher temperatures. Mm -hmm. um, so you got to think like there's probably strains that we have in our tank that are more resistant than yeah. um, certain other ones in nature. They just tolerate better, you know, better temperatures. Um, I've also heard that the Red Sea is has been a, a really good environment for like the corals there are very resistant. Mm -hmm. um, so it'd be interesting to know if there's something that's different about those corals that really gives them this, you know, super coralness. <laughs> but now yeah, I don't know. It's like yeah, if you took a red planet frag and you put it in, you know, a coral farm in Bali, like would it? How would it do? 
I don't know. <laughs> that is my yeah. nemesis curl. I've tried like five. Yeah. It's finally growing my tank, but I li- I've probably tried five yeah. times over the last like eight years to finally have one that grows. That has been my <laughs> nemesis. But yeah. like, yeah. is that going to be a thing at one point where we have these like rock solid corals where it's like hard to kill them? Like they're just super solid, yeah. you know, like beginner friendly. Life's good. You're not have to worry about it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I would hope that there's a time where, um, you know, the sci- science side of things looks a little bit more to um, the marine hobbyists for a little bit of insight on things. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, I mean, we talked about this with Ryan, too. It's like, you know, fix fix the, the big problem needs to be fixed. We don't need to just find these little solutions for, you know, yeah, it's like, sure, yeah, we could get a coral that can tolerate an extra couple degrees that's great. But like, if the water keeps getting warmer and warmer, like, you know, eventually we're screwed anyways. So yeah, I don't know. Big downer. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah. I mean, like, I don't, I can't remember if it's Sanjay or Mike Plett, but I remember one of them, like there's would be like survival the fittest to an extent with the corals and certain ones would just be like super hardy. They're just like the bulletproof corals over the many years. And, Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. I kind of wonder if like, you know, over enough years of us reefing, are we just going to have, you know, certain corals that are just bulletproof? Yeah. I mean, I think so. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know how much really. Yeah. Is, is there something that's gradually changing and morphing? Like it's the same DNA, right? Mm-hmm. But, like the only thing I can think is the Zozanthale, like, because we have yeah. corals from different regions. Mm-hmm. So the Zozanthale in Australia is probably a little different than the stuff in Bali or yeah, you know, but like even Jakarta or Java. Right. Yeah. True. But like, if you look at, or I guess example, like the forest fire digi where my original chunk looks like boring crap, but my, my new growth that grew up in the tank looks amazing. So is mm-hmm. it just because that's like the environment it grew up in or is it cause it's better adapted to it as it grows? Like mm-hmm. all, all these little things I wonder, like, is it just, okay. Yeah. You're, you're bred for tank life. You're happy here. You know, life is good. Yeah. And it's probably just like little tiny differences in conditions there too. Right. Like so Mm -hmm. many little micro micro differences that seem to sometimes matter a little, sometimes matter a lot. It's hard to say. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Coral health, coral coloration, uh, bacteria. Have you, what's your thoughts on how much of a role does bacteria play or how much, do you ever supplement it or you're like, I've been reefing for a bazillion years. My tanks are as solid as could be. Life is good. Sorry, I'm just getting rid of my dog. <laughs> He's trying to add He's some whining. bacteria diversity He's to the whining. tank. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been like big on talking about bacteria for a while and I haven't mm-hmm. done the uh, microbiome test yet. Mm-hmm. But um, I definitely know that doing chemicline periodically seems to make my tanks better. Um, I, and I, I don't like, I don't like that. That's a thing. Like, I don't like the <laughs> fact that it's like, you're, you're basically resetting, um, you know, some of your bacterial, um, load, but I actually think that a lot of our tanks have too much bacteria. Um, like I don't, I don't think it most of the time is like people that are adding it. Mm-hmm. I think there's tons of bacteria in our tanks. Like, I don't think we're lacking in it. If anything, we might be lacking in diversity in some situations or lacking in the right ratios. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, uh, yeah, I did add some bacteria to my tank a while back. Um, and I've tried a few different products. And I, 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 my reason for it was just like, maybe I'm going to help the good populations, the, the populations yeah. of the good stuff, mm-hmm. you know, uh, be more prolific over the bad ones. Um, but, uh, it's, it's hard to say for sure. I mean, I think, I think that people should be careful and not thinking they just keep, need to keep adding microbacter seven every week or whatever. Like once Mm -hmm. the tank's established, just, just leave it. It's fine. You don't need to keep pouring bacteria in. When you're first starting a tank, I definitely think there's lots of benefit, but yeah, ongoing. Yeah. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Yeah. It now that you said it, it'd be super fascinating to do like the microbiome before and like a week after doing a chemical treatment and see how much of a difference it makes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine mm-hmm. that it just really changes the, the diversity. Um, but uh, yeah, corals seem to get like better after you treat chemically. 
like I, I, I yeah there's a thing that does happen with some of my acros is uh there's a few pieces that are really uh prone to this darkening around the base and it's this mm -hmm. thing where the tissue gets kind of dark and the polyps kind of shrink um and the the tips and most of the rest of the coral are fine but i found it on uh, pink lemonade does it uh mm -hmm. my maleficent kind of does it around the base and when i treat the chemicaline it seems to uh mm -hmm. get better afterwards Interesting. Um, but like that's great and all but i don't want to keep treating chemically because there are other risks when you do chemically and i think i think for the most part it is pretty safe to use but um every time you use it you've got micro bubbles and then your corals are a little bit irritated so like if your corals are irritated they're not going to grow as much for those days so you yeah. have a chance of having an outswing um, your skimmer so goes bananas for a while <laughs> yeah your skimmer goes crazy um, so it's more like if you're going to do chemically like make sure you're ready to manage all aspects of the tank. Like when I do it, I, uh, I change my trident. So it tests, you know, eight times a day instead of four or whatever. Is that right? Yeah. I, I set it. So it tests eight times is hardcore. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, I, I, I mean, if I could choose, I, I wish I could just do it manually, you know, like, I mean, sometimes I just do a manual elk test yep. right on its own. Um, but, uh, yeah, I so I know. I mean, I've always thought bacteria is like it's kind of like the thing that like we just don't quite have a good amount of data on. Mm -hmm. um, because one of the other things that's that's talked about is how um, corals aren't actually very good at taking in nitrogen, phosphorus. Not so much. I wouldn't say for the zooxanthellae, but the actual polyp of that of yeah. the coral. I'd say they're not they're not great at taking those elements in on their mm. own but if they are consumed by bacteria they're good at consuming the bacteria yeah. that has the nitrates and phosphates lou um, from tropic so, has some really good talks on that yeah yeah no he's yeah. the guy that's the big advocate of that um i think there's a lot to that actually yeah because i think that like as much as we can get things as stable as possible things are always going to change over time and mm. i think a lot of the time I would say one of the main things is, is it's going to have something to do with bacterial composition. Yeah. And in that yeah. train of thought, bacteria is also feeding your corals, which is going to aid to its health, right? If it's getting a extra diet yeah. via bacteria, right? And that's just another catalyst or I guess like method to give it those nitrates and phosphates that it needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. So it's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what was the thing? Uh, Cause you did the microbiome, um, you ha didn't have a i think it, it was something about how running UV, your diversity went way down and then i had a ton so of diversity for yeah no i've only done one i had a ton of diversity yeah. but it was like different than a lot of the normal tanks yeah yeah maybe it was somebody else that was saying they did one before they had a uv and then after and after they put the uv on it was like way way less diversity but the tank didn't do worse or anything, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, yeah, it was diverse yeah. with an unusual composition. <laughs> As I read the email. Yeah. Unusual composition. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, I, I will probably do that soon. Um, it's, it's interesting. Like, like it's, learn. yeah. Yeah. So he goes, there are very low levels of pelagic bathic tourists. I didn't know how to pronounce this. Anyways, be likely the result of your UV sterilizer, but also had a ton of diversity on top of that. But I'm going to say a month mm. before I did this, I also added a bag of Miracle Mud, added a bag of the Aqua Forest Life Bio, like I added a bunch of stuff to increase my diversity. Mm. And like a month yeah. later, I did this test. So I had yeah. super diverse, but I had like interesting yeah. kind of results. Yeah, uh, well, it'd be interesting to see. I mean, you can't really gather much in the data until you... Uh, you test again, right? Yeah. So I don't know if you, know. If you test, we'll, we'll compare notes one day. It'll be interesting to see. Like, I yeah. think, yeah, I think bacteria is very important. I basically think it rules the world. Like it does everything. It's what breaks down things. It's basically, you know, inside of us, it's what digest stuff like bacteria rules the world. It does everything but with the yeah. fish tank. I think right now it's interesting, but I still think it's very young and I don't think it's like, it's hard to action off of that data. Like it's interesting data, yeah. but what do you do yeah. about it? Yeah. And I think, yeah. Of, and I think, 
um, it, like by sending these tests in, like they're constantly learning too. So like yeah. um, it's Eli, right? Yeah. Yeah. It is I mean, Eli. I think from from the sounds of things, he is uh, he's pretty passionate about what he's doing, and I mm -hmm. think that you know as as he gets better and better at understanding uh, and seeing uh, you know things that seem to correspond um yeah you know we're gonna we're gonna uh, probably i i like in five years it'll be freaking awesome, amazing I yeah 100 percent agree yeah, like yeah. we we're yeah. building the database we're building this knowledge set currently yeah. with exactly. everyone that does a test and it's it's still fascinating yeah. to see what's in your tank and what are the ratios and what's happening but yeah you, it, you it's hard to action off it unless you know you do multiple tests down the road and compare things and see how things are changing you know or maybe we both do tests and you yeah. know your tank's doing amazing and I'm missing something and I find a way to add it. And also my tank's amazing. And we're like, okay, this bacteria does something awesome for the tank, but I think it's still young. Like eventually I think it's yeah. going to be like amazing, but I think it's still young for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that it's another reason, like I was saying is like, do it so that you can mm -hmm. support the company and so they can get more data. It's like something yeah. like 23 and me didn't, didn't get to be good because you know, the, it, until a whole bunch of people did it right. Like yeah. you needed that database. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think um, I think he's pretty good at communicating with people too. So, yeah. like, if you want to talk about, um, you know, something that's specific about your system uh, and get his opinion on it, I think he might be able to take a look at your test and, and weigh in on it. Um, yeah, like he yeah. sent me a big email afterwards explaining his interpretation yeah. of all the results and what he thinks about everything, which is cool, right? Because yeah. then you're getting more yeah. of an expert analysis yeah. rather than just the data. Yeah. Well, we expect him to do that with everybody in every single test that he ever gets. And <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> You'd go crazy. But, yeah. yeah. The the one yeah. thing that I found was super funny in mine, he goes, one surprise in finding there's a small amount of DNA from an amphibian sometimes kept as pets, a fire belly toad. How is that in my tank for DNA? What? Completely random. Yeah. But he put it in the email. He's like, fire belly toad, like, baby, the pet store that I bought something from did something that contaminated it. It was the weirdest thing. That's crazy. I'm like, I huh. I mean, I have dart frogs now, but I didn't at the time of this test, and they're not even the same thing. So anyway, that was yeah. super, the most randomest thing yeah. to get back yeah. in it, which was interesting, that's, but that's, super random. That's wild. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that's telling you anything. <laughs> that's crazy. Pretty, pretty much. That was just yeah. this random bit of tidbit information that threw me off at first like what the heck yeah totally all right uh, anything else you want to cover today well i mean i feel like you know we probably it's 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 like hard to reach the subject but um yeah obviously we've had a pretty tragic um loss Icon for the re Iconic. community this week yep yeah and i i have definitely it feels weird talking. Like I feel like I've been a little bit weird today, just because I'm like everybody's feeling a little bit off hearing about Jake. Yeah. Um, it. Yeah. It is. It's definitely weird. Like for me, it's hard. It's almost hard to. Believe. It's even though I know it's true, it still feels hard to believe because he's been such like an, an iconic person in the industry. You know, everyone's seen yeah. a bazillion of his videos, and lots of people have met him at shows and talked to him. And yeah, it yeah. is. It is sad, and it is still super hard to believe that that happened. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I made a post about it. I really kind of had some time sitting with it and thinking about mm -hmm. it. And I mean, there's just really nobody quite like Jake as far as like somebody that ties together, you know, some of the commercial parts of the hobby, like really keeps everything down to earth with like yep. the podcasts and the way he talks about stuff. I mean, it's, yeah, just to think there's, there's no more re therapies happening. I hope that there is something I, I mean i'm sure mark will eventually make a comment but i mean everybody that is you know was close to him has got to be just going through a lot right now um yeah yeah but and i mean it's funny i something i said in my post too is like like something like the reef therapy podcast you listen to a podcast enough and you kind of feel like you know people really well like i didn't i don't jake and i only talked a couple times like on the phone but you know, mm -hmm. you kind of start to feel like you kind of, they're like, it's like a one-sided friendship. Like, I, you know, like, oh, I know what Mark would say in this situation. Yeah. I know what Jake would, Jake would totally be like, oh, like this about this thing. And it's like, you know, they kind of become these almost friends to you, mm -hmm. you know? And it's, it, it's uh, true. Yeah, just thinking about that being, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I also think about, you know, what, what he would have done. He's, he's only 41 years old, you know, somebody that passionate about, um, you know, 
marine hobby biology all of that stuff he, he would have done a lot with the rest of his life yeah so yeah i, I think there's things are going to be different for like maybe this point on a little bit because yeah, yeah it, it was just, definitely uh, an icon in the industry so it, it is definitely sad and especially you know it is weird in the way you say because you do feel closer to somebody like i have met him in person at shows and he would always give me heck if i pronounce something yeah. wrong or didn't use a scientific name so we had yeah, like an yeah. interesting relationship yeah. but we'd like yeah. geek yeah. on random things but <laughs> it, it definitely yeah. is sad and like it's weird how it affects you so much because you're not like personal best friends with them but you still have a relationship with them and even you know yeah congesting you know just from random chats and ingesting the content and stuff you do feel like you're have that extra level of relationship so it, it does hit you in weird ways yeah. so but yeah, yeah I, I mean totally. i definitely feel bad for like his wife and you know future unborn kid like my heart goes out to them but yeah yeah no it's uh it's heavy and i think uh yeah people are going to be feeling feeling this loss for for a while yeah um i just so, posted a, yeah. a, a link in the chat but i know there's a gofundme if anyone does you know want to help out his family there's definitely a gofundme for them yeah I think it's kind yeah, of cool for yeah. his wife and and future, I, I wasn't kid. aware there was a there was a kid on the way. Um, that's mm -hmm. even more more heavy. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Well, I so. didn't want to end on a sad note. We were either going to yep. start on a sad note or we were going to end on a sad note. But um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that there's definitely going to be a voice in some of our heads sometimes when it's like, what would Jake think? Here. what would he every say? time would he i say a can i'm gonna hear him giving me <laughs> shit telling me it's micromesas yeah head. <laughs> yeah my thing my thing yeah. is uh if i say uh, a head of a torch or a head of a hammer i remember mm -hmm. him saying something like i lose respect for anybody that doesn't say polyp that says head <laughs> like, <laughs> all right <laughs> yeah i know eh yeah it's true but yeah no i mean if anyone if you know you do he has touched you or helped you in some way and you want to help out the family i did post that link in the chat so yeah totally there is that yeah, that's good all right guys hopefully yeah. okay well, well hopefully you enjoyed it adam oh, you close it yeah thank you for coming yeah, on today for on. good chatting yeah, anytime sure. anytime um yeah if you guys right. enjoyed it hit the like button you want to check out some of those beautiful corals that have been slideshow in the background check out adam's site at frag garage which is linked in the comments below all right, guys, hopefully you enjoyed it. Hit the like button.